before I read the, the passage this evening, I would like to just uh, give an analogy of what is taking place here in Isaiah 58. Uh, years ago, the uh, cars used to have a bench seat, and uh, when young couples were first married, of course, um, the wife would sit very close to her husband, and uh, along about the time when, uh, say, this particular couple was in their middle ages, or they were middle-aged, <laughs> <laughs> they, um, the wife noted that uh, she was sitting right next to the door on the opposite side. And she looks over at her husband and she said, Honey, do you remember how it used to be with us? How I used to, how we used to sit so close to each other? And he said, Yes, I, I remember that well. But he said, I didn't move. <laughs> <laughs> And the uh, analogy here is, is the very same thing. Uh, Israel is, is crying out to God. Uh, why aren't things the way they used to be? Because uh, Isaiah prophesied during the time of Hezekiah, and, and Hezekiah uh, was one of the uh, great prophets uh, during the uh, time of Hezekiah's reign. And what I want us to note is it wasn't God that changed here. They're crying out because of the misery that they're in because of their sin. God didn't change. It was the people of Israel. And when they come to realize it was their, their issue, their, their need to change, uh, then the Lord uh, brought them the spiritual blessings that they so desired. I'm going to read this passage, and I would just like to highlight some points here in regards to uh, the spiritual light uh, for those in darkness. We are living in dark times, and uh, we need to focus upon uh, God's sending forth spiritual light, spiritual awakening, a reformation, we are in that time, and may God give us a burden for that, and I'm glad to see that you have that burden here at Grace Orthodox Presbyterian Church. Beginning in verse 1, I'm going to read this chapter, and I would like to point out some things for us to note. Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet. And show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways. As a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinance of justice. They take delight in approaching to God. Wherefore have we fasted, say they. This is what they're saying to God. We have fasted, and thou seest not. Wherefore have we afflicted our soul, and thou takest no knowledge. Behold, in the day of your fast ye find pleasure and exact all of your labors. Behold, ye fast for strife and debate, and to smite with the fist of wickedness. Ye shall not fast as ye do this day, to make your voice to be heard on high. Is it such a fast that I have chosen a day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head as a bulrush and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Wilt thou call this a fast and an acceptable day of, to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I have chosen to loose the bands of wickedness, 
to undo the heavy burdens and to let the oppressed go free and that she break every yoke. Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry and that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house? When thou seest the naked, that thou cover him, and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh. Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thine health shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee. The glory of the Lord shall be thy re reward. Then shalt thou call, and the Lord shall answer. Thou shalt cry, and he shall say, Here I am. If thou take away from the midst of thee the yoke, the putting forth of the finger, and speaking vanity, and if thou draw out thy soul to the hungry, and satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall thy light rise in obscurity and thy darkness be as the noonday. And the Lord shall guide thee continually and satisfy thy soul in drought and make fat thy bones and thou shalt be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters fail not. And they that shall be of thee, shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt rise up the foundations of many generations. Thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shalt honor him, not doing thine own ways, not finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words. Then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob, thy father. For the mouth of the Lord had spoken this. And so, beloved of God, what we have before us here is, first of all, in these first uh, three verses, I would like for us to note the cause of Israel's spiritually dark days. We would all admit that in our time, these are spiritually dark days. And we need to acknowledge that it is because of our sin. And that is exactly what the prophet tells the children of Israel in verses 1 through 3. Notice that it is Isaiah the prophet. It is the work of the evangelist. It is the work of the preacher, to warn the people of God when they are out of the way. Just this weekend, I had a member that said, I won't be at church, which would be today. I got to go work. And uh, I asked him, I said, uh, what does the Bible say? What does the fourth commandment say? And uh, does it not say that uh, you are not to work on the Sabbath day? And he acknowledged that what I told him was the truth, though it was hard for him to swallow. And he said, I'll be at church. And he was at church today. We need to stand up and, and, and we need to talk to the people that are out of the way and to point them in the right way, in a loving way, 
that they may not uh, stir up the wrath of God. As we see in the latter two verses, particularly, uh, the breaching of the Sabbath day was one of the causes for the darkness that had come upon the land. Uh, today, this generation knows very little about the keeping of the Sabbath. And uh, it is something that uh, we need to proclaim, especially to God's covenant people, that we are bounden to God's law as a standard of righteousness and to obey out of a heart, not to merit God's grace, but out of a heart of thankfulness for our redemption. There are consequences for our actions. Uh, sinful actions will bring about evil consequences. And sometimes it may last for generations, those consequences. So it's so very important that we know what the Word of God says and that we follow uh, the Word of God. So the cause of spiritual darkness is not God's fault. It's man's sin. And it is important that those who especially minister the Word to cry out. And, and it's not something uh, that is to be done uh, in a corner. This is something that is to be done publicly to cry aloud to the people like a trumpet and show the people, that is, the people of God, their transgressions and the house of Jacob, their sins. Now, because of our sinful nature, we oftentimes do not see our own face. And we need the mirror of Scripture to show us wherein we have sinned. We have David, uh, this holy man, David, who had committed the sin with uh, Bathsheba. And for some time, he was able to keep it a secret and then the prophet of the Lord came to him and pointed out to him his transgression. And God gave him repentance of that sin. And we have recorded in Psalm 51 that prayer of repentance for his sins. So the word of God needs to be proclaimed to the people of God so that they see their sins. And they see the need of repenting of those sins. That passage that we just read about our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, quoting uh, from the Old Testament about Galilee, uh, that uh, there should arise a great light in darkness. And when Jesus, who is that great light, came to fulfill that in Galilee, his first words were, repent, repent, and believe the gospel. So the beginning of the remedy of spiritual darkness is a call to repentance of, of our sins. As I mentioned regarding David, he was in a particular sin and he uh, was able to put it in another compartment and not to think about it and to just move on with his life. No doubt he continued on his worship of the Lord. And, and as the people here in Israel, they were fasting uh, and the Lord was not hearing them. They were crying out to the Lord. They were afflicted in their soul. And they were asking the question, Lord, why are you not hearing us? And then the Lord begins to show them what they need to do if they would see God's blessing, if they would see light 
spiritual light. That is spiritual prosperity, uh, love, and, and all of the graces of the Spirit manifest in the people of God. It comes about through dealing with those areas wherein we have sinned against the Lord. And so the prophet tells them very specifically, in, uh, beginning in verse 4 and following, uh, yes, you fast, but your heart's not right. There's strife, uh, there's debate, debate. You even smite, strike with the fist of wickedness. What kind of love is that? Ye shall not fast as ye do this day to make your voice to be heard on high. Is it such a fast that I have chosen a day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head as a bulrush? In other words, this was hypocrisy. They were uh, in sin, but they disregarded that. They didn't like the misery of their darkness, and so uh, they wanted to shift the blame onto God. And God said, this is the problem that you have. Yes, you're going through uh, formal worship. You're, you're going through all of these things that you think are going to bring about uh, an answer to your problem. But the Lord is saying, this is all hypocrisy. Your worship is hypocrisy. They fasted, but they did it in hypocrisy. And in fact, uh, hypocrisy, as Thomas Watson says, is, is really a breaking of the third commandment. Hypocrites take God's name in vain because their religion is a lie. They seem to honor God, but they do not love God. Their hearts go after God their own lust. This is what we have here with the children of Israel. The hearts were going after their own lust. They did not love their brother. They were coming to, to blows with each other, fighting with their fists, smiting one another, debating, and then coming to the Lord in a, in a false, humil false humility and an external worship. And this was obnoxious to God. They were guilty not only of breaking the first table and the third commandment, particularly in their hypocrisy, but they were also guilty of in violation of the second table of the law. That is, their uh, attitude and their conduct toward their brother, as we were reading there. This is not the fast that is acceptable to the Lord. Now, in spite of Israel's sins, God reveals to them the remedy. That is that they must repent of their sinful ways. Now, I've often thought about the time of, say, a a true reformation, a true uh, visitation of God's Spirit. I, I like the word revival, but we know that the revivalists of a century or so uh, have somewhat given a, a negative connotation to that term. But it is, a, it, is, it is in the Scriptures, and so it is a biblical term. But if we want to see revival or reformation, if we want to see visitation of the Spirit of God, what would it look like? Would we know it when it came? And so, in verse 8 and following, Isaiah here then tells them what that light will look like so that when it comes, they will know. Of course, it will be a time of great happiness and prosperity. If they turn, repent, as our Lord Jesus Christ called upon his generation to repent of their sins, 
and to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Then, verse 8, shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thine health spiritually and also physically as well shall bring forth health speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee. The glory of the Lord shall be thy reward. In other words, the Lord shall go before you. The Lord shall follow behind you. He shall be with you at all times. And you shall call, verse 9, and the Lord shall answer. Thou shalt cry, and he shall say, Here I am. And this is what they wanted. This is what they were looking for. Problem is, they were not dealing with, with their sins that lay between them and the Lord. Unrepentant sin. If thou, verse 10, draw out thy soul to the hungry. This is showing brotherly kindness instead of hatred to the brother. Strife and contention. Show love, which is the principle of the whole second table of the law. Love to our brother. If thou draw out thy soul to the hungry. Now, in saying this, I'm not saying that uh, by doing these things, by showing this love to our brethren and being faithful in our worship and keeping of the commandments regarding the first table of the law, that we're meriting this bringing in of light. All of this is of grace. But God works through means. He works through uh, repentance. And when there is truly broken and contrite hearts, then we will see that spiritual light shine as the noonday light. And that's what I pray for. God would bring in our generation. I have no doubt that uh, in God's providence, uh, he will bring that uh, great visitation upon the nations. But we in our own generation need to pray that the Lord would give us a taste, even a foretaste of that light that he speaks of here. If thou draw thy soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall thy light rise in obscurity, and thy darkness shall be as noonday. And the Lord shall guide thee continually, and satisfy thy soul in drought, and make fat thy bones. And thou shalt be like a watered garden. Oftentimes, the, the, the chief blessings in a time of visitation of God's Spirit are the spiritual blessings, the grace of love and of mercy and of joy and happiness. Uh, these are evidences of the presence of the Lord giving us that spiritual light. But also, when the Lord visits his people, he often gives Temporal prosperity as well. Not that uh, we would seek that, but oftentimes we see uh, where the people of God came to repentance before the Lord, that the Lord sent uh, great prosperity. You know how it was with King Hezekiah. King Hezekiah talked about inheriting a mess. King Hezekiah inherited the mess of his father, Ahaz. And he had actually, Ahaz, his father, King Ahaz, in Judah, had actually boarded over the temple. And within one month after uh, becoming uh, the king, after Ahaz passed on, he had the temple opened up and ready for operation within a month. But they still hadn't gone through all the ceremonial cleansings uh, that uh, they were to go through uh, according to the law. And they had asked for, for God, 
God to give them forgiveness for not doing the, this completely, but uh, being that uh, the, the, the urgency at hand, God forgave them and, uh, and uh, received their uh, prayer to find mercy, to move forward the work of reestablishing the worship, the true worship of God. And we see some of the happiest days in Judah were under King Hezekiah's reign. And uh, God mightily blessed uh, King Hezekiah. And along with uh, that, primarily came the, the spiritual blessings. They were able to come into the temple as they were not before under uh, King Ahaz. Under Hezekiah, they were able to Restore the true worship of God. And spiritual blessings, uh, you read about that uh, in the Chronicles. Spiritual blessings were just flowing out uh, to the king and to the people of Judah. Temporal blessings as well. And so the Lord pours out uh, his blessings when he sends forth his light. Primarily, the focus is the glorifying of God, the people living for the glory of God and caring more, more for anything else than this world, but to further the kingdom of God. They shall be of thee that shall build the old waste places. We, uh, it's sad, you can go to uh, some of the uh, old Buildings that were church buildings, I'm, I'm told, in Holland that are now theaters because there's a lack of attendance, people going into the church uh, to worship. And should God visit that place, I would pray that those church buildings would uh, be reconverted back to a place uh, of worship. And we see that when... God visits his people here. A promise is given in verse 12. Building the old waste places. Rebuilding uh, that worship of God in its purity. Thou shalt raise up the foundation of many foundations of many generations. And thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach. The breach that was made by uh, the people's sin before God. And the consequences of that. That breach had been repaired by the generation that truly repented. I know we're very familiar with that one passage, but it is a key passage to this whole matter of bringing spiritual light in type, times of darkness. And that, that is uh, 2 Chronicles uh, 7.14. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. The Lord says, then I will heal, I will hear from heaven, I will uh, forgive their sins, I will, I will heal their land. You know, uh, today in our own country, we're talking about the healing of this nation. It does need healing. There's a lot of things that are wrong and they've been wrong for years the abortions that are going on, the, uh, we could go on and on and list the things that are wrong in our nation. And it would be our hope that God would so visit the, this nation that people would repudiate these things as uh, nauseous, as, as something that is uh, evil and, and wicked cease their evil ways, and that he would return us to a way of peace and of righteousness. That's what we pray for. And so in verses 8 uh, through uh, 12, we really see what that showing of the light is in darkness. It's finding true happiness and joy in the Lord. Loving him and worshiping him and loving our brother and showing kindness. 
It also is a day when we will see the Sabbath day properly observed. One thing I have always appreciated about the Westminster Standards is uh, the way it is so well articulated as to the keeping of the Sabbath day. Um, our confessions don't have that uh, explicit uh, detailed observance of how we are to keep the Lord's Day holy, but I think it's excellent what you have in the Westminster Confession. And that is a, an important matter. It is an important matter in this generation. And when the Lord sends the light of revival, of reformation, we will see, as we were singing in that hymn, we long to see thy churches full. We'll begin to see the churches filled. We'll begin to see people, instead of working on the Sabbath day, we'll begin to see them in the Lord's house. It is of great importance that we remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. In admonishing the young person that I talked with, I reminded him of... Uh, Isaiah 58, regarding the Sabbath. Verse 13, If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thine own pleasure, notice it says, on my holy day. The Sabbath is the Lord's day. It's not our day, it's His day. And even in the Old Testament, He says, this is my day. And Sabbath breaking, uh, I wish I had the quotes before me, but uh, uh, Dr. R.L. Dabney has a very excellent uh, treatment of this matter of the Sabbath. And uh, he said, uh, not keeping of the Sabbath is an inlet to all manner of evil and immorality. When we let down on the Sabbath, Culture becomes wicked, and we have seen that happen here in our own land. So we do need to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And, and as we do, God brings blessing, and he will honor those who honor uh, his day. Notice it says, not doing your own pleasure. How often uh, the Sabbath day is a day that... Uh, it is a day of pleasure. Some churches have very early services in the summer so that they can, so the people that can get in their boats and go out and have a, a longer day out on the lake. Um, these things are lawful, but on the Lord's day, it is His day. It is a day that we are to give ourselves uh, to, as Bunyan said, a day of spiritual marketing for the soul. Uh, and it's not a day of, uh, for us to have pleasure, to seek even our own words. Our words should be about heavenly things. They should be about those things that are edifying for and uplifting for our brothers and sisters as we worship together. When you do these things, the promise is, in verse 14, thou shalt delight thyself in the Lord. They were not finding that delight. And that is what they longed for. The Lord is saying here through Isaiah, do this and you will delight yourself in the Lord. And I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth. That is, they will become a nation that will be a, a nation of very high reputation in the face of the earth. He will lift up that nation and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob. That is, uh, regarding the promises uh, of God in his word uh, to Jacob, our spiritual father. Uh, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. So here we see cause of their darkness. Uh, we see the remedy for the darkness. 
we see what that light is and what God calls for us to do, uh, especially in keeping of His Sabbath. If we would see uh, the spiritual light that we so long for. It is my prayer, and I pray continually for this very thing. God promises here in this passage that, that He will send spiritual light and He will dispel spiritual darkness. And it is only the Lord that can do it. And He does it by His grace and grace alone. But we must apply ourselves to the means of prayer. We must apply ourselves, what this chapter is telling us, to the means of of having a right heart, wherein we humble ourselves before God and we love Him as we ought and trust Him in His mercy, trusting in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ and having that love as the second table of the, command, uh, second table of the Ten Commandments requires, a love uh, toward our brother as well. And so I leave you with this looking to the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ as the means by which we obtain that light. As J.C. Ryle said, look steadily at Jesus on the cross if you want to feel inward peace. Look to anything of your own and you will never feel comfortable. Your own life and doings, your own repentance and amendment, your own morality and regularity, your own church going, your own Bible reading and your prayers, your own alms giving and your charities. What, what, what are they? They are all but a huge mass of imperfection. Rest not upon them for a moment in the matter of your justification as evidences of your wishes, feelings, biases, tastes, habits, inclinations. They may be useful helps occasionally. On grounds of acceptance with God, they are worthless. That is, anything that we do is worthless rubbish. They cannot give you comfort. They cannot bear the weight of your sins. They cannot stand the searching eye of God. Rest on nothing but Christ crucified and the atonement He made for you on Calvary. This, this alone is the way to peace. This is the way to the spiritual light that we so desire. Then shall thy light break forth as the morning thine health shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee. They, it says, then shall thy light rise in obscurity, and thy darkness be as the noonday. Amen. I'd like for us now to have a stand for a word of prayer, and then I'll step down. We'll have the Lord's Supper.